Ladies and gentlemen, and a wrap out in between, I'm the pixelated man known as some guy. And thank you very much for choosing to watch this video, which just so happens to be Bizarre Earthquake Day 1, the sequel to Bizarre Earthquake Day 0, otherwise known as the previous video. Hopefully you watched it, otherwise you're going to be a little bit confused. Nevertheless, let's jump right back in. <laughs> Oh, sorry to interrupt your Jet Boy experience, but I want to say something before the video gets a little bit too far. I looked up the guy who made this game, Fahith Azum. I hope that's somewhere in the ballpark. Hell, this is how this Texas type Turkish lady pronounces it. Fatih Azum. I'm assuming that's close to right. Anywho, I looked this dude up, and what little information I could find out about this guy leads me to believe that he's a pretty okay dude. He's been involved in the AGS scene for a while now. He's made some freeware games. He put them out there, and people seem to think they were okay. Hell. Even Bizarre Earthquake seems to have its origins in a 2014 freeware release called, believe it or not, Bizarre Earthquake. Now I'll probably have to take a look at that in detail. It's not a particularly long game and feels more like a demo for this game, except, well, the main character is fat and has a mullet. But other than that, it's a very similar game. But anywho, beyond making AGS freeware games, like a Turkish Day of Gilbert, this man's actually done some translation for other game companies, in particular Crystal Shard. He did the Turkish translations of some of their games for free. That's a pretty cool thing to do there, man. So yeah, I just want to make it clear that the dude who made this game, he is clearly a fan of adventure games who is making adventure games. And I will not knock a person for trying to be creative and for being passionate about something. And it's also very clear to me that this man does not have a whole lot of money because this game, hell, his company does not have a website. Yeah, I almost feel like we gotta start a Patreon for this dude. But anywho, I just wanna make it perfectly clear there ain't nothing personal with me and Mr. Azum. He's a cool dude in my book who made a very interesting game that I am more than happy to riff on. It's all in good fun, folks. Just like this song I'm about to play. Well, start back up. Cue the intro for real now. And with that little diddly, day one begins with a pre-rendered cinematic. Oh my dear, silky smooth animation. And is it just me? Or in my little diddly mind, does it look like she's about to go down and well, um, try to suck venom out of his nether regions? Just saying, he could have been snake bit overnight. We don't know what's in this wild. So Hoochie calls him fathead, and she's like, ha 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 ha, I startled you, and you sleep with your clothes on. The exact same clothes that you wore on the way over here. My god, those things must be filthy, dude. And why can't you sleep under the sheets like a normal person? It's like this dude just passed out drunk here. So, I'm gonna go ahead and assume for the rest of this day this dude is hung over. So he walks downstairs, goes to the jeep, and the lady's like, yo! Let's find my phone. And if you remember in day zero, that's what we were doing as her, as canned soup, wandering the beach looking for a phone. So this will mark the third time that we are doing the same damn thing. And in fact, if you play as canned soup, that's all you've been doing this whole damn game, trying to find your phone. But any hoot, it turns out that Kansu's biggest problem with finding her phone was that she did not bring Boar along with her. Because the dude finds it. It's in the ocean. I don't know how it got from her hand to the ocean, but hey, earthquake logic. But even now that we have the phone, we ain't on the gravy train yet. Now the phone's screwed up, and Kansu's like, oh my god, that phone's super expensive. I'm very materialistic. It's like an iPhone 10, and it's ruined now. And Boar's like, chill, girl, chill. I'll go fix your phone because I'm handy like that. Okay, I may be being a bit unfair to canned soup here. After all, the real reason why she wants her phone fixed is because she recorded a peculiar sound before the earthquake struck, and she thinks the sound's related to the earthquake. And speaking of earthquakes, our heroes go off to the woods to look for earthquake stuff because they're seismologists. 
And this is when I knew I would never cut it as a seismologist. Because you see that little gray little path looking thing? Not quite in the background, but what the heroes are walking to. Now to my non-seismologist eyes, it looks like a path. Like it's flat on the ground, so to speak. But now, nah, man, that's a big ass crack that's apparently two bits of the earth that are seared open. Yeah, it's like we got a little fault line here. And the depth perception's really messed up in this game at times. But with that said, Boar's still pretty damn eager to climb down in it. And Can Soup's like, oh hell yeah. We need to get down in that crack and see what's going on with the earth. Because we're in a race against time. Because if other seismologists find this, then they'll know it exists. And I don't know, maybe get a head start on their paper for the seismologist journal? Yeah, I didn't really bring this up yet. But Can Soup has this weird thing about her where she is so driven to get some information about this earthquake before any other seismologist because what peer review works really quick in turkey or something i just don't understand why she feels like it's so damn urgent she just keeps saying it over and over again like oh other seismologists will show up and that's bad for us because i don't like to cooperate with others maybe she really does have a terribly abrasive personality and perhaps boar would be better off career-wise at least leaving her and finding someone else to team up with just saying i wouldn't be surprised if canned soup had burned plenty of bridges in her career but even though i said all that i almost suspect that maybe this game was originally written to be something of a redemption tale for canned soup like she's a disgraced seismologist whose radical theory has been rejected but now she stumbled across some earthquake and she's like oh my god this earthquake is the piece of the puzzle i've been looking for all this time i will no longer be a laughing stock in front of my colleagues but this is just stuff i'm making up because the game hints at none of this. All we know is Can Soup really, really wants to research his earthquake before anyone else for reasons that are never really explained at all. And oh yeah, I almost forgot this major plot point. There's a mysterious blinking red light down in the crack. And no, you don't see it. You just gotta trust the game that it's there. But any hoot, it must be a bomb. What? That's not a spoiler. What else blinks red in video games? What? A broken microwave? Yeah, right, like they're gonna add that much detail to any damn game. So our heroes make it back to the hostel and oh no. Can Soup's worst fears have been realized. There is a rival seismologist team that has made it to wherever we are at. And they're all like, hey, we're gonna research earthquakes and stuff. And Can Soup's like, oh hell no. Yeah. Can Soup's gonna dust off her brass knuckles and go toe to toe with the rival seismologist. And if you don't think watching seismologists fighting would be interesting, look at this grainy cell phone footage I found of a fight that happened at a seismologist convention in the bathroom. These people are intense. So now it appears that we have an enemy, or a rival at least, or something. Yeah, I'm never going to understand why Can Soup doesn't want to work with other seismologists. After all, it's not like the scientific community has ever been able to achieve anything through cooperation. But nevertheless, the rivals leave to do earthquake stuff, and Can Soup's like, Damn it, we only got a day head start on these fools, and my cell phone is ruined. Boar, fix my phone, I'm going up to my room to do earthquake stuff. And that's what we do. So now we got a nice little point of divergence here. We can play as Boar and try to solve the puzzle of how the hell do you fix Can Soup's phone, or we can play as Can Soup and try to figure out where the earthquake's epicenter was. Well, let's go ahead and check out Boar's quest first, which is fix the water damaged phone. Now you may be wondering to yourself, how the hell are we gonna do that? Why? The same way you do it in real life. You go to Google and type in how do I fix a water damaged phone and you find a handy how to guide and then you just follow the steps. Now you may be thinking guy that's not really a funny joke. But no I'm being serious there. You have to apply real world logic to this game's puzzles. Well at least at times. Like you fix the phone how you would fix a water damaged phone in real life. You know you clean it, you put it in rice, leave it to dry out. I'm not kidding you there. It's actually really damn cool, and I have to admit that Mr. Azum can design some pretty cool puzzles, because I was very pleasantly surprised to find out that, oh my god, I have to apply real-world knowledge to solve a puzzle in a video game. And I always love it when adventure games do that, when they don't assume you're an idiot. 
when they're like, hey, this puzzle is just like real life. Do what you would do in real life and oh my god, it works. But what doesn't work, you see I did a segue there, is just how slow paced this game is. Now I haven't brought it up yet because there really hasn't been a moment to bring it up. So I figured now is as good of a time as any to bitch about how slow paced this game is. Even by adventure game standards, this game is slow. The characters move like they're walking through molasses, and in order to do anything, you pretty much have to cycle through all your little action icons to get to the right one. Now I know that may sound like a minor grievance, but when you realize that the majority of the time you'll be spending in this game is watching the characters slowly move from point A to point B, or watching yourself cycle through all the action icons to get to the right one to use on the right thing, yeah, the whole process just became really damn tedious after a while. I just wished I could have skipped through all the walking. I just wish I could just click on things and the game would know what I wanted to do with it. It just kind of felt like the game was bogged down and needed to do a rail or something, drink an energy drink, get some energy in it. Cause it just felt like it was dragging its damn feet. And speaking about dragging my feet, let's get back to what Boar's doing. Dude fixes a phone, goes back to canned soup, and she's like, oh my god, Boar, you're a genius. By the way, I figured out where the earthquake's epicenter was. Now you may be wondering, guy, why didn't you sell canned soup figuring out where the epicenter was? Well, <laughs> that's the thing about Bizarre Earthquake. It bizarrely handles the whole two protagonists thing. Like, let me see if I can explain this. Unlike most games with two protagonists that you can swap between, Bizarre Earthquake is a bit weird. You see, once you complete some puzzles or some actions as one character, if you swap over to the other, it's like the game fast forwards, and that character is caught up to where the other character is. I know that doesn't make much sense, but basically, once I completed all the actions as Boar, fixing the phone, the game fast forward to the point where Can Soup had already figured out where the epicenter was. So there was no way for me, at least no way that I could figure out, for me to be able to solve both Boar's puzzle of fixing the phone and Can Soup's puzzle of figuring out where the epicenter was without just starting a whole new game and playing as can soup. Now this may lead you to believe that this game is designed in such a way that it's intended to be played through twice through the eyes of either protagonist, but that's not the case. There are certain bottlenecks in this game where you have to swap over to the other character, and when you're playing it through for the first time, you may not know this. And therein lies one of the key problems I had with Bizarre Earthquake. You see, there'd be times I'd be playing as one character and I'd hit a wall. I'd be like, damn, I don't know what to do with this character. Hmm. Perhaps I need to swap over to the other character and they need to do something. Oh wait, damn, the game's completely fast forward through a big chunk of it. For real, that would happen quite a bit in this game. Just swapping between the characters would cause entire scenes to be skipped over. And what makes it all the more frustrating is the simple fact that there are times when you absolutely have to swap between the characters. Yeah, you just wait till later on in the game. This became a pretty big deal. But any hoot. With all that foreshadowing out of the way, let's get back to canned soup. Basically, she needs to place a dot on this map. The dot is the location we were last at. It's made all the more challenging because for some reason the photo she has has a weird filter effect on it. But anyway, yeah, place the dot where it goes and then boom, Boar comes up and he's like, hey, I fixed your phone. So again, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to swap between the characters to complete both necessary actions. But yeah, Boar says the exact same thing, fix your phone, blah blah blah, then out of nowhere, one of the rival seismologists shows up, and she's like, oh my god, the dude I'm with, he's lost in the woods, would someone please save him? And Boar's like, I'll be your white knight, I will save that dude who we're rivals with, and who we hate or something. And Kanzoop's like, cool, while you do that, I'm gonna look for some personal information in the guest book about these people because I don't trust them. But you save them. Again, I, I don't quite get what's going on here with this whole other seismologist group. I'm starting to think Can Soup just might be a very antagonistic person. <laughs> Yeah, the sound design this game can be a little bit all over the place. Look, based on what we just heard, it feels like I'm walking into a horror game. But no, we're just looking for a dude in the woods and there he is and holy crap! He's trapped in the bear trap, the dude is gonna die! Now the game tries to pass it off like it's no big deal that the dude's foot 
is clearly and visibly caught in a bear trap. That dude is going to lose his foot. The game's like, no, no, no. His foot's stuck in between the sharp bits. He's fine. Just a little bruise here. Nothing a band-aid couldn't patch up. So yeah, Boar frees the dude, gives him a band-aid, and it's all gravy from here. We go back to the hostel, and oh my god, Can Soup's done doing what she did. So I guess I should show you what she did. So basically, all she did was turn on the stove to fool an old lady to think she was about to burn down her kitchen in order for her to look at the guest book and discover that the rival seismologist had been at this hostel before. Yeah, that's important information, because I guess they lied about having never been here before, but yeah. We now know the dirtiest secrets behind the rival gang. They've stood at this hostel before. I wonder if they left a review on Yelp about it. And yeah, that does it for day one. We saved an old man from a bear trap. Turns out he lied about being in this hostel before, and we discovered a big-ass crack in the middle of the woods that we need to explore. And I'm sure we're going to do all of that in day two, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between. So hopefully I'll see you then. Have a good day. Uh -oh. Subscribe! Oh.